during this time today, I want to spend a little time looking at where the truth has led us. Let me say over the past, what, 20-something years? In my experience, it has been uh, 1996. What is it? 19 years? Is it 19 years? 19 years since we, we became involved with what is today probably popularly known as the, the Truth About God movement or the Godhead movement. I've been a Christian for, I keep saying, 40 years. But um, I think my adventure into understanding truth in a deeper way began when I first came to understand or I became involved with this movement. Because... Um, Back in Jamaica, in the group that I belonged to, we began to understand the truth about God. Sometime before I became involved with the movement, maybe about, maybe about 10 years before, because we were a little group studying together, and we had, we had separated from the main church, so we, we felt like we were free to study. And in studying the Bible, we came to see that God was not a, a trinity. But it didn't really take a hold of us in terms of making us excited but in 1996, when we began to discover the history of, of, of the Trinity, and we began to understand what had happened in the Adventist Church, to be honest, it stirred up anger, it stirred up alarm, it stirred up a sense of betrayal, it stirred up a sense of indignation, and we decided to get, we had to get involved in a more complete way. And so that's when we, we began to become involved with other people from different countries, and we started visiting the United States, I mean, Brother Howard and myself. And one thing I noticed, because I suppose in some ways we are almost pioneers in this movement. I know there were some people before us, long before. I know the history of people like um, uh, Edson and um, somebody named George Gro. I know about Fred Alabach and Doug Goslin and Linford Beach and coming up the line, Alan Stump and then us and then other people and then people who are even now just discovering the truth. And some of us may not know the history of it in, in, in this particular movement. But one thing I noticed right at the beginning was that many people were concerned about, the, about expressing the mechanics, the mechanics of the truth. And even today I find that there is some kind of emphasis on that. They are, they are more concerned about, or their emphasis is doctrinally proving the facts. And I understand when, when you, are, you, you have discovered something for the first time, that is important. And that excites you. But anybody who has been in the movement for a long time will tell you that after a couple of years you burn out. You can't go on repeating the same doctrines in the same way, two years, three years, four years, over and over and over. After a time, you suffer from burnout because the truth is intended to take you somewhere. It's not intended to just stimulate your intellect. After a time, that becomes the novelty wears off. And you start looking for something else to do. And I've seen it happen with, over the, over the period of time, I've seen it happen with many people. They are all excited and then after a while they drift out and they go back to something else because the, 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 the novelty wears off. And what I want to talk about today, I've said this before and you've probably heard me talk about it, but I'm going to give a different title today. Today I'm going to entitle what I have to share, The Path of Consistency. Because I believe that if you are consistent and you, you, you accept the truth, you're open to listen to God. It's going to take you somewhere. There's a destination. The truth about God was not intended by God to be simply a doctrine that you receive and then you sit with it or you, whatever you want to do with it. It's, it's intended to take us somewhere. And that's what I want to emphasize today. The path of consistency. Where does it take us? Um, so I noticed that at the beginning. When, um, when I got into the movement... There was this emphasis on just, well, in many places, I, I, I'm not saying it was this way with everybody, but it seemed to predominate, just a doctrinal emphasis. Not long afterwards, people began to talk about the love of God in giving his son. And things began to change a little bit. There, were, there began to be a little meaning to the truth about God. 
people began to understand you can never appreciate, fully appreciate the love of God until you understand what it was that he gave us. I, I, I don't have anybody in here who is really my relative. But Howard is my, is, my, is my countryman and he's my good friend and my co-laborer for, for many years. And if I, if I sacrifice, if somebody needs to, 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 to suffer greatly and I send Howard, you know it will cause me some pain. But it's not the same thing as if I had to send my grandson. Now, anybody who has been in touch with me for the past two years, you know that God has given me a new lease on life. I have a two-year-old grandson. I never knew, gran- I never knew grandparents could love grandsons so much. I-, I can't remember if I love my own children so much. I can't remember. The memory is gone, but I tell you, this little boy uh, he- he is the joy of my life. And I can't think what would ever make me want to hurt him. When I think of this, it's easier for me to remember that it was his son that God gave. It wasn't his friend. It wasn't his co-worker or associate merely. It wasn't a co-equal person who was, and, and we're in this together, and so you can go or I can go. It was his son, the son of his bosom that God gave. And as we began to understand this, the Godhead truth began to take on a little life, a little meat. And it became a little bit more personal. Our appreciation, our appreciation for God multiplied when we understood this. And this became an emphasis. A really necessary and vital emphasis. And, um, but, but many people have not moved on from there. And like I said, the truth is intended to take you somewhere. One neglected aspect of the Godhead truth is the truth that the Holy Spirit comprises the very life, the actual life, the actual living presence of Jesus Christ and our Father God. None of us has ever come fully to grips with what that means. We have not. Man, sometimes you think about it and you start to shake a little bit. Really? The living presence of the living God? I know some brethren who have said that the Holy Spirit is simply the thoughts of Jesus. There are some people who teach it is just a power like electricity. Some people have said that as you read the Bible, you begin to think like God, and because you are thinking like God, in this sense you are said to have the Holy Spirit. Both of those concepts destroy the personal presence of our Savior and our Father. And the implications of that presence is what I want to really talk about. As I've been saying this week, you can't believe certain things and keep still. You can't! You can't! How do you keep still in the presence of such a reality? I know people who say they have seen ghosts, right? They rush into the room, wide-eyed. They're here standing on end. I saw so-and-so. They're agitated. They can't be normal. Man! Because they have seen something supernatural. Your body is a temple of the living God. A truth far more stupendous than anything you have ever heard in this world. That is what we are trying to do, to come to grips with the truth. But this is, this is the second aspect of the truth about God that is often <coughs> overlooked. It is not taken into account enough. And I believe that because we, some of us, I think that the speakers at this camp meeting, I can freely and happily say, have been stepping forward in the implications of what does it mean that we actually possess the very life of Jesus Christ. It takes you somewhere. And it began to take us, uh, I'm talking about our experience, Brother Howard and myself, a little bit. It took us one step further, and we came to an understanding about something called the two Adams. God opened that door. I'll, I'll say a little bit more about that in just a moment. And then from the two Adams, we went a step further. We went a step further to begin to understand certain aspects of righteousness by faith. And then God took us a step further to begin to understand what it means that we live in the kingdom. That Jesus Christ came and established the kingdom in one sense. And look, I tell you, I've never been so blessed and so excited in my life as understanding these things. 
And for those of us who understand that there has been some kind of rift in the movement and some kind of tension between different ministries, I'm telling you that this is what has been the cause of it. Without trying to justify myself or justify those of us who believe a certain way, I'm telling you this has been the cause of it. The reason has been the difference that some ministries believe in the actual living presence of Jesus Christ and that this is everything that we ever need or will ever need. And some people don't like that idea. Simply put, in its raw, simple, blatant simplicity, that is what it is about. So what I'm, I'm, I want to do is to try to show us today, step by step, how we come to the end point if we follow the path of consistency. Now, of course, I don't need to, pr- to go through all the proofs and demonstrate that Jesus is the Son of God. The Bible is very strong on it. He, he was the Son of God before he came to earth. He became the Son of God a second time when he was, he was born into the human family. He became the first human being that was exactly what God wanted man to be. And so, he became the first human being who was ever fully the Son of God, I think, since Adam. So he was the Son of God again in a second sense. And many people don't understand that he became the Son of God in a third sense, according to the Bible, when he was resurrected from the dead. Because when Jesus was raised from the dead, Jesus died to sin once and for all and forever. When he rose from the dead, he was raised as the, 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 the first of the new human race. Because a new human race, you know, Paul talks about, I want to know him and I want to know the power of the resurrection. I want to know that too. I don't fully understand it. But there's something about the power of the resurrection. Paul talks about it. Jesus Christ, it says he was crucified. He died in weakness. But he lives, what does he say, in strength. But he talks about the power of that resurrected life. We have to learn to understand and to believe what it means to experience the resurrected life of Jesus Christ. In the book of Ephesians, it says, in Ephesians chapter 1, it says that he was, he, Paul wants us to know the exceeding greatness of his power towards us, which was exhibited when he raised Jesus from the dead and exalted him to the right hand of God, far above all principalities and powers and every name that is named in the entire universe. That is where we have been exalted to. What does that mean? Man, Man, may the eyes of our understanding be enlightened to grasp what God did for us in his son. A lot of Christians are focused on Jesus dying on Calvary. They don't go beyond that point. But the real power of the Christian life is the power of the resurrection. So, we we became thoroughly settled and established in the truth about the Godhead. And then one One year, 2005, I went to Australia. And I'm telling you everything, because you're my friend. I'm not going to hide anything or or go around the corner, right? I went to Australia, and a lady invited me to her home, and she said, there are some tips I would like you to listen to. Now, yeah, I have an open mind, thank God, and I listen to everything. Even if Jehovah's Witnesses give me something, I'll read it. But the lady, I asked, who, whose tips are these? And the lady said they were by a man named Jack Sequeira. Anybody ever heard that name? Yes. I heard the name. And I was warned about the name. And I didn't want to really bother with Jack Sequeira because I don't have time to waste. If, if the man is an apostate, why am I going to waste time listening to it? But, but I only knew he was an apostate because of what I read. Vance Farrell said he was an apostate. Colin Standish said he was an apostate. Everybody said he was an apostate. So, of course, he must be an apostate, right? Anyway, I decided to listen to the tapes. So I went home, and I listened to them, and I didn't hear anything so alarming. I mean, much of what he said was what I believed. But I didn't realize that there was one thing he said that I had never understood properly. And I found out one morning, because I was in my kitchen praying, one morning, and... um, You know, it happened a lot back in the past. I'm in the kitchen praying and I'm saying, oh God, when will I ever be what I want to be? When will I ever be? Because I've been trying so hard. 
and I can't make it. When am I going to make it? When will I ever bring to God again for the millionth time the same prayer? Because I've been trying to be perfect for the past 30 years and I'm still not making it. And just out of the blue, something that Sekira said just flashed in my mind. God was speaking to me. God said, you don't need to be perfect. You need to die. Look here. I'd understood about death before and I tried to die. I tried to die. I'm not supposed to try to die. I can't, you, you, can't, you can't con yourself into death. The concept of the two Adams finally opened my mind. There are two existences, two lives. One life is lost. One life is condemned. One life is helpless and hopeless. As long as you live there, all your efforts will get you nowhere. It is an impossibility. The Bible says the carnal mind, the old man, the body of sin, it is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God and it cannot be. You're over on this side and you're saying, Lord, please help me. Lord, I'm trying. The problem is not lack of help or lack of trying. The problem is that you are still alive. And as long as you live, you will never, ever please God. I realized that the problem was that I needed to exist in the new existence, the second Adam. There is a life over here where sin does not exist. There's a life over here where sin is not a problem. There's a life over here where sin has been put to death and it has been given to us as a gift. I never understood that. I thought I had to work my way from side side B to side A. I never understood that it is a gift freely given. That when I receive Jesus Christ, I become a part of the new existence And like the Bible says, my struggles are over. Because it says in Romans 6 and verse 7, he that is dead is freed from sin. Period. Because like the Bible says, he that is born of God does not commit sin. Period. Why does he not commit sin? It is not the abundance of his struggles and the urgency of his efforts. It is the fact that he is born. It's his identity that that sets him free from sin. That is what I read. That is what came to my mind. It was just so beautiful. Like I said the other day, it was like I'd been trying to climb a mountain of glass covered with grease, a smooth hill made of glass, covered with grease. Every day I'm struggling. I gain one inch, I drop back six inches every day of my life. And I'm begging, Lord, please help me. And one day the Lord, one day a man appears, like I said, with a crown of thorns and nail prints in his hand. And he says, come around the back and I'll show you something. I go around the other side of the mountain. And there's an elevator going to the top. That's what it was like. That's what it was like. I tell you, man, you know, when Jesus says my yoke is easy, my burden is light. I got up out of my kitchen that morning and my burden was light. In one moment, understanding the truth, I was was delivered from the years of buttering. And my wife thought I was going crazy. Because, I mean, the way I put it across to her, I said, dear, thank God I don't have to be perfect. All my life I'm talking about perfection, and now I'm coming to tell her I don't have to be perfect. And she was alarmed. But in the evening I explained, in the evening I told her, I don't have to be perfect. My perfection already exists. My perfection is already there. My challenge is not to become perfect. It was such a relief because I'd been working so hard and getting nowhere, and now I realize that I can have it as a gift. It is already there. That's what the truth of the two Adams did to me. And I began to share it. And in sharing it, I lost friends. As the Lord lives, I lost friends. I don't know what was so ugly about that doctrine. But I think it was that some people thought, I'm making people believe the Christian life is easy. I think they believed that. I think they believed I was teaching cheap grace. At least that's what some people said. But I don't know whether it's cheap grace or expensive grace, whether it makes it easy or hard. But when I looked at the Bible, that is what I saw. And I'd never seen it before because my mind had been so conditioned to think a certain way. And when I saw it, I lost some friends, like I said, some very good friends. I was cut off from some ministries. Everybody knows the history. I was sad. But I was glad to because I I felt like my mind had been liberated to preach the truth. And I could start out afresh talking to people 
who would listen to me honestly and not being concerned about whether other people would condemn me or not. It was liberating. I felt like I was free. And that's what happened when I move on to st- step two. But look here. I'm going to explain to you how it is connected to the God of truth and how it really, why it really made such an impact. Because I never understood, you, you can't accept the truth about the two Adams unless you understand that the Holy Spirit is actually the, the life of Christ. Because how did we end up with the life of the first Adam? How did we end up with it? Because you know the Bible teaches this. It's not my, my doctrine. Romans 5 and verse 18 says that by one man we were made sinners. It uses the word. By one man's offense all were made sinners. Romans 5 verses 18 and 19. As by one man's offense, condemnation came upon all men. Biblical. So, how did we inherit this offense from this one man? You know, some people teach that we, we inherited it because he was guilty and God made us guilty. And I've been accused of teaching this. This is not true. I don't believe this. I don't believe you can be guilty for another person's sin. God can't ask me and question me about what Larry did or what Adam did. I wasn't there. I didn't do it. How could you make me guilty for what Adam did? I say publicly and openly and clearly, I don't believe one man can be guilty for the sin of another. But I believe one man can inherit the problem of another man. Because if you have a disease and you have a child, the disease can pass on. I know many children born with knock knees are cast eyes are one hand because they inherited some defect from their parents. Adam and Eve took the whole human family onto the side of the side of reality where we are separated from God. And every child of Adam is born in that condition. There's not a child who has been born on this earth who was born united with God except Jesus Christ. Because Jesus says everybody must be born again. And that's so because everybody is born the wrong way the first time. You're born the wrong way. If you're not born the wrong way, you don't need Christ to save you. You're born with salvation. And nobody is born like that. So, we inherited life from Adam. That's what makes us lost. And so we have to inherit the, the life of Jesus Christ. It's, it's the same on the other side. So Jesus actually passes on his life to us. And that's what salvation is about. That's what began to open up to our understanding next. The nature of salvation. Because look at, look at this. This is how most people understand salvation. Okay? They say, man sinned. Listen to all the, the, the sermons. Man sinned and he became guilty. And because he's guilty, he has to die. Why does he have to die? Because the law is so holy and God is so holy, if you, if you bite a fruit between meals, you have to die. And so you have to die because you are guilty, because the law is so holy, the law condemns you and you have to die. But what God did, God says, okay, I'm going to send somebody to die instead of you to pay the price. So somebody requires a price, and Jesus came to pay the price. And so Jesus paid the price, and so you're no longer guilty. But now, you have to go and try to keep that status of not being guilty and hope you can make it right through to the end. And if you happen to sin, you can go back and ask for forgiveness again. But, but the concept that I had, and that I think many people have, is that Jesus' purpose was to forgive your sins and to, and, and, and to encourage you to go and fight in the future. Cover the past, and it will help you now to fight towards the future. But the actual reality that in Jesus Christ, you have become a new creation, that Jesus didn't come to cover sin, the, the, the guilt. What Jesus come, came to do was to give you a new existence, a, a different life that, that, that does not face the weaknesses of the old life, a life in which sin has been defeated. Jesus came to do something practical and living and real. He came to bring us life. That's what he says in John 10 and verse 10. I am come that they may have what? Life. And have it more abundantly. That's what he came for. When he was talking to his disciples in John 14, in verse 19, he says, look here. When he talked about coming back again as a comforter, he says, at that day, you shall know that I am in my Father, 
and you in me, and I in you. Do you know that? Because I live, you shall live also. That's what he said. Do you know that the disciples at that moment were not alive? They were not alive, he says, because I live, you will live. They weren't living yet. They weren't living yet. Those men who had been, he had sent out to cast out devils and priests, they weren't living yet. He says, at that day when I come again, because I live, you shall live. I've been saying all week, we have not grasped the meaning of what Jesus came here to do for us. We have lived in impotence and weakness because we have not understood the truth. But I believe we are in the end of time and God is opening the eyes of those who are willing to have them open. God is helping us to hear who are willing to listen. I believe it. Yesterday I was talking to somebody, I forget who, but we were talking about the latter rain. And um, I, was, I, I, I was thinking, the latter rain, we have always talked about this final great outburst of, of, of the power of God. But the more I understand, the more I'm tempted to believe that it is not God doing something brand new. It is God's people finally understanding and believing. Because Pentecost was forever. God never took it back. Apostasy and unbelief drove it out of the church. God didn't take it back. Pentecost, it, it, Pentecost was a stage in the life of Jesus Christ. He died on Calvary. That was a Passover. He was resurrected. That was the first, first fruits. Pentecost came 50 days after. It was, the, it was the giving of the life of Jesus to his church. One day forever. He never took it back. God didn't say, I'm giving the life of Christ to the church and I'm taking it back after a hundred years. And then you have to go on and struggle again to find it back. Pentecost is the glorifying of Christ. And when he was glorified, he passed it on to his people. He never took it back. We are the way we are today because we have not been able to come to grips with the truth. That is a fact. But I believe God is opening our understanding. And understanding perhaps is the first step towards faith. When you know, you can start thinking about it and reaching out to experience. When you know, when you don't know, you are just doomed to remain in darkness and impotence. But God is opening our eyes and I can say hallelujah, praise his name. So, when we came to understand the truth of the two Adams, we saw that you can't understand the two Adams if you don't understand the truth about God. Because the two Adams, the second Adam has to pass on his own actual life. Now the doctrine of the Trinity says it's not Jesus who is with us. It's a third person. So the, the parallel is broken. Because over on this side, here's Adam. And he passes on his life. And he passes on his life to all of us. So every one of us have, ha, is born with the life of Adam. Over on the other side, here's Jesus Christ. But no, it is not his life he passes on. It's a second person over here. Or a third person who gives us his life. The parallel is broken. The picture of the two Adams does not make sense if you, if you believe in the Trinity. Furthermore, as Brother Nada was saying earlier on this week, Adam didn't just give us life. Adam gave us life with history. In other words, what Adam experienced has been passed on to his children. Did Adam introduce corruption into the human life stream? His children experienced it. Did Adam introduce weakness into the human life stream? His children experienced it. In other words, it was not just that Adam introduced separation from God, but everything that goes with it that was already in Adam was passed on to his children. On the other side, it is equally true because the parallel is very important. Paul goes to great lengths in Romans chapter 5 to bring out this parallel. If you, if you have never read that chapter Read it in, a, in, a, in, a, in an easy translation because it's very difficult for some people to grasp it because what it is saying they don't want to hear. But when you read it, you understand Paul is saying there are two people, two men, and the destiny of the human race depends upon your relationship to these men. That's it, simple and plain. Your destiny depends upon your relationship to one man or the other. That's it. It's not about your works or your efforts or your labor. It's about your relationship to one of these men. How many times does the Bible have to say it? John 3 and verse 18 says what? He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already. It's about whether you believe in the man. 
That's what decides whether you are condemned or, 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 or you are justified. And everybody is still buttering his way through trying to do what Christ has already done, trying to obtain that righteousness by living well enough. I suppose many people have the fear. I've heard people say, well, if you talk too much about grace, the problem is that people will become careless and grace will become disgrace. Absolute rubbish. Absolute rubbish. Well, I don't know, I don't know how much we appreciate Jesus and his Father. I don't know. But I'm going to tell you, if you threaten me with hell, I'll find a way to rebel. But if you give me love like I've seen in, Jesus, in God and his Son, every time I, I step aside from their will, I am deeply grieved. I don't like it. I don't want it. You don't have to threaten me when I've discovered this kind of love. You don't have to threaten me. Appreciation and love, I will do anything for them. Anything. I'm not exaggerating either. I will do anything for them. My whole desire, every time I sin, you think I care about myself? I am saved. I'm going to heaven. I'm going to see God's face. I knew that 40 years ago. I'm not worried about my salvation. But it bothers me when I let them down. It bothers me when I come short of the mark. It bothers me that so much has been done for me and I'm still being stubborn and wayward. You don't have to give me rules or laws to make me want to serve God and his son. We don't have to be afraid when we present grace. Those who understand and appreciate God's grace will never abuse it. So we don't need to say, well, then if you talk about God's gift in his son too much, people are going to become abusive and careless. No, that's not a legitimate fear. People are afraid of it because they say we want our church to look good. And so we, we have to make sure that we keep the church in line by giving these rules, making everybody understand that these rules are what we live by. But that is when you're dealing with carnal people. Carnal people do need rules to be kept in line. I agree with that. That's what God did to Israel when they were carnal people. He put them under the law. He gave them the law. And, 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 and when you give the law, you better be prepared to give the penalties too. Because if you broke the law, you were to be stoned or you were, you were to be, be put to death. All kinds of things. Because when you're dealing with carnal people, they, have to, they, they only conform because of fear. So when you deal with people on that basis, fear has to be the reason that you give. You have to, give a, you have to, you have to, to deal in the realm of fear to obtain what you want. And then you still don't obtain it. Because all you do when you make a man afraid, you turn him into a sneak. You make him go underground. You don't change his nature. You only make him good when you're around. And as soon as you're gone, he does what his nature says. It doesn't really work. So, the two Adams I learned, I could never have understood the two Adams if I had not understood the truth about the Godhead. The truth that the Holy Spirit is the life of Jesus Christ. Jack Sekira, the man I listen to, he doesn't understand it. He believes in Forensic justification, I mean legal justification. He believes in the legal issue. He believes Jesus died to make us acceptable to God legally. And that's what most Christians believe because they don't believe that the Holy Spirit is actually Jesus Christ himself living in us. They don't see the transfer of life like with the first Adam. What they see is a transfer of legal, what do you call it? Legal terminology brings legal status. But they still see that you are left to struggle to maintain that, that sense of uh, that, that relationship, that victory over sin. Yes, they say Jesus helps you. He sends you some kind of help. But they don't see, they don't believe in the perfect parallel between both things. That is where my mind began to be opened up. That's where I stepped away from these people because I understood the truth about God. So when I got the two Adams... My mind took me a step further than all these people had ever gone because they could never go that other step because they believed in the Trinity. You cannot understand the two Adams properly unless you grasp the idea that the Holy Spirit is Jesus himself, his very life. Then the two Adams make perfect sense. But if you're a Trinitarian, you can't understand why you can't, you can't get it. You can't. Because it is not Jesus' life that you receive. It's the a, it's a life of a third person who was never even a man, who never even lived here, who never even suffered in my place, who never even knew what it is to experience temptation. 
How does he give me life? What kind of life is he giving me? A life that has no victory in it. The Trinity destroys the true concept of the two Adams. But because I understood the truth about God, it took us into that second step. And like I say, many of our brethren refused to come with us. I don't know if because they heard the name Jack Secura or what, but they, became a, they, 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 they disassociated themselves and stepped away and had nothing to do with us since. And I know that it happened with Brother Nader and Imma down in Australia. As long as they continue to talk about, talk the, the, the normal way. When they began to understand about the two Adams and to teach it and the implications, the same thing happened to them in Australia. When I heard about what was happening to them down there, I did not mourn. I rejoiced. I rejoiced. I realized that when you step into the truth, sometimes it causes separation. Let it come. I love, I love the people. I love the detractors, but I love the truth more. And I'm happy to see brothers and sisters who are not afraid to step into the truth. And when they, 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 they received it, I was rejoicing. Because I know, look here. You can't stop the truth. If it's me and Howard alone... It's going to spread to all those of us who love the truth. And if it's four of us, me and Howard and Brother Nada and Imar, Imar, it's going to go much further and much faster. Australia is so far away. I've only been there a few times, but God has some people down there, down there who now understand and are spreading it there. Praise be to God. And I know it's going to continue to spread and multiply. So, we understood the truth about the two Adams. That we have the very life of Jesus Christ. And then it made us understand the nature of salvation. Because salvation is really about the impartation of new life. That, that is hardly emphasized. Most of the time you hear people talk about Jesus. What do they talk about? He died on Calvary. They talk about his death on Calvary. And they say Jesus died instead of me. But when you understand the nature of salvation. You understand that is not the truth. Jesus didn't die instead of me. Jesus died to take me to death. He died to put me to death. Because when Jesus died, the life that died is the life that I now receive. So Paul says, we are buried with him by baptism into his death. We die with Jesus Christ. I died 2,000 years ago. I might only receive that death today. But like I was trying to die so hard in the past and I couldn't die because David was trying to die. You don't die by trying to die. You when, you, when you, you unite your life to Jesus Christ, you experience that death. You don't die. You can't die. Try to die. You won't die. Self won't allow you to die. But when you have identified with Jesus Christ, when you have received him and he has become your life, you will find that you are dead. You are dead to sin and alive unto righteousness. So that's the nature of salvation. Salvation, a man is not saved just because Jesus died 2,000 years ago. A man is saved when Jesus lives in him. Salvation is the transference of life. And you won't hear the majority of the Christian world emphasizing that. They'll talk more about the legal thing that he did. He died to cancel our sins and so forth. And so, so the death of Jesus has become very irrelevant to many, to much of the Christian community. Because it's about something that happened 2,000 years ago. And you sit down and struggle until the second coming. And, and, and you kind of in a kind of limbo. You hope you're going to make it and you're struggling your way through and you thank him, yes, because he died for you and he paid the price. But what is there for you today in your practical everyday life? What is there for you? When discouragement comes or when you're having an argument with your wife or your husband or when you are deprived in, in deprived circumstances, what is there for you today? Look, my life is a life of Jesus Christ. You can't get me down. How, how, how does the nagging of your husband affect you when you are Jesus Christ walking in this body? I don't say that blasphemously. It is Jesus who lives, Paul says. It is not I. It is Christ who lives in me. You can annoy David easy. How do you annoy Jesus Christ? He only wants to love you. He only wants to be patient with you. He only wants to end your pain and your, your distress. That's all he wants. So that is what salvation is about. And we came to understand this. And then we went on to the next logical step, which is the truth about the kingdom. 
Because as soon as you begin to understand the truth that is Jesus living inside of you, then you're going, you're going to move on to the next step. If Christ lives in me, what does that mean? It's interesting. The Bible says that the last message to be preached on the earth is the gospel of the kingdom. Jesus says, Matthew 24 and verse 14, this gospel, not just the gospel, not just the gospel. Many people mistake it and say we are preaching the gospel. Jesus says it's the gospel of the kingdom. We talked about that yesterday evening. What is the kingdom? The kingdom in essence is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That is the good news. And this good news of the kingdom, this good news of the indwelling Christ, this good news of the renewed existence shall be preached everywhere because it is is the only thing that can give hope to this world. It's the only thing that can break men free from the power of sin. This good news of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world because every man must come to understand how good our Father has been and what he has given us. And everywhere you look in the New Testament, you see Paul says everywhere he went preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Go go through, take a concordance and look up the word kingdom in the New Testament. You'll be amazed. You'll be surprised because you don't realize how much the disciples emphasize the kingdom till you look up the word kingdom. Go in the book of Acts, you see it everywhere. You go to the writings of Paul, you're kind of amazed because you you can pick out all the doctrines that they taught. The second coming of Christ, the resurrection, the, the, all kinds of things. But running through everything is this truth about the kingdom. It predominates and it absorbs their minds because it is, it is everything. Because the truth of the kingdom is that God has established a spiritual kingdom in the hearts of his people. And we are no longer subject to the principles and the, the values and the, the domination of this planet. We serve a different king. And that is why we live on this earth, but we, don't, we are not of this world. We, 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 we belong to a different kingdom. So, that was where we ended up next. And then we began to understand something that we are still trying to come to grips with, but I'm going to share it anyway. If Jesus lives in you today, does he not live in you in the same way that he lived 2,000 years ago. Does that make sense? So, then issues, questions like spiritual gifts become simple to answer. The church, you can understand why the church, when it had Christ living there, was full of the power of the Holy Spirit. You can understand why the dead were raised and the sick were healed and people spoke in different languages and demons fled when they saw these people coming. The power of Christ in these people was so great that even the shadow of Peter falling on people would heal them. Greater works than Christ himself did. Jesus says, the works that I do you shall do and greater works because I go to my father. And when he went to his father, he was going to come back in even greater power when he was glorified. So he living through his people would manifest these powers. That's why I say I think the latter rain, what we call the latter rain, is simply going to be an awakening to the truth of what God has done for us already. So, Jesus, I believe, I don't believe that God needs to do too much today that he has not already done. That probably is a, is a final concept that came to my mind when I began to understand this. Because there are verses that say as much, aren't there? It says, um, Peter says, his divine power has given us what? Do I need to find the verse? Everything we need. Everything we need. Not will give us. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Already given. Man. Amazing. And then he says again, Paul says, Paul says, Ephesians 1 verse 3, I believe he says, God has blessed us with what? All spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Every spiritual blessing. It says in Romans chapter 8, He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also what? Freely give us all things. It says we are made joint heirs with him. Not in the future. Today, we are joint ears with Jesus today. Everything that he possesses is mine. 
But all of, the, all of this is contingent upon the truth that his life and my life are fused into one. The blessings are in Christ. They are nowhere else. They don't exist in David. They don't exist in this denomination. They don't exist in this philosophy. They exist in Jesus Christ. One of the misconceptions that we, we also came upon, I, I, I am persuaded it's a misconception. When Brother Howard and I were looking into some of these things earlier on, we agreed with the popular idea, but then afterwards we had to change our minds. Because the popular idea is that when Jesus died, every human being was taken and placed in Jesus. That all human life was placed in Christ when he was on the cross. So in that sense, we died when Jesus died. I, I tried to understand it because, you know, I, I used to do a little bit of art. Where's Cliff? Yeah, like Brother Clifford. But because of that, I think visually, I like to see things in order to understand it. Now I can see how I received Adam's life. Because you can draw a diagram, you can draw Adam, and you can see the channel of life. Because men and women pass on their life to their offspring. Nobody has been created since Adam was created. No other human being. Eve got her life out of Adam. Cain and Abel got their lives out of Adam and Eve. In fact, all the life that we have now is still Adam's life. Because it's the same life that was passed on through procreation. There was no life created after Adam was created. So, you find that because of this, sometimes... Whatever, whatever infected the original life, you find that it affects us today. And it answers some questions because you say, how is it that a child is born with one foot? And you say, God created that child. How is, that, how is it that children are born retarded? And you say, God created that child. Because God created all men in one man. God never created any of us individually, otherwise we'd all be perfect like Adam. He created the one man, Adam, that one life, and then that life became corrupted. And so that life began to be passed on in its corrupted form. And as time passed, it became even more corrupted, deformed. And so you have these, so you can say God created all life, but he created it in one person. That's how God operates, right? So I can see that. But I can't see how God took up all of us and placed us in Jesus. And I wasn't even born. Draw me a picture of that. And how does it look? It doesn't make logical sense. What happened was that God took another man, the second Adam, Jesus Christ, and that man, just like the first Adam, was put into a place of terrible temptation. On Calvary, he faced Satan again the second time. On Calvary, he met what Adam met in the garden, but in a far different way, because now he was not a perfect man. He was a deformed, he was a, a, a beaten, battered human being under the effects of sin, and then God took away his presence from him. And there he defeated the devil. He defeated Satan. So now there was one human being who had no sin. There's a human life where there's no sin. So in that human life, everything that exists in that life is redeemed and saved and victorious. But the problem is, how do we get it? Well, you know, you read Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 10. Listen to what it says. He ascended up far above all heavens that he might do what? That he might fill all things. You read that verse and think about what it means. He ascended up far above all heavens that he might fill all things. Jesus went back to heaven and he was glorified. God poured his spirit into him without measure. And so that same power and that same life now, Jesus is now omnipotent because God has given him this power. He's now able to take that life that conquered sin and infuse it into every one of us. Everybody is saved in Christ. If you are in Christ, Nobody is saved outside of Christ. The whole world is saved in Christ. You must be a part of that life. So, so it follows the same pattern, the passing on of life. But if you are outside of Christ, you don't exist in the new creation. You don't exist. It doesn't matter that you look at the world and you don't see the, these divisions with your eye. The Bible gives it to us that in Jesus Christ we are saved. Outside of him, we have nothing. It's about which life we possess. That's what salvation is about. And I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, it is the only way that we can ever become what God wants us to be. We must come in God's way. We must accept God's gift. 
Even if we fail to misunderstand it and have the best of intentions, you know what's going to happen? We're going to wander in the wilderness for 40 years and then another 40 and then another 40 or maybe 170 years like the Adventist denomination has done. Because with the sincerest of desires, you still can't bypass God's way. Because God's way is the only way in the universe that it is possible. So I, 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 I want to thank God for what he has, for where he has taken us. I want to thank God that as we have walked the path of consistency, we have seen more and more. Like I said yesterday, at last in my life I can say, at last I can say, Jesus is everything. Hallelujah. I always wanted to say that. I could mouth the words, but my heart never responded. I could mouth the words. I could try to put him in in different sermons, but it wasn't real. But now I understand. Now I understand what God has done. And sometimes it makes me want to laugh. Sometimes it makes me want to cry. Sometimes I can't contain myself. It's beautiful, brothers and sisters. And I hope that every one of us in here will become a part of that unstoppable army who goes forth with this great truth that God has wanted us to to be preaching for so long. Thank you all for your attentiveness. May God continue to bless us this Sabbath day. Let us pray. Thank you for watching the video. I hope you have been blessed. In fact, I hope you have been greatly blessed. If this presentation has been helpful to you, you can help others to find this channel and to Interact with these videos simply by hitting the like or dislike button and even better by subscribing to our channel. So I want to encourage you now to just hit the subscribe button and subscribe. It will be a great help. And if you'd like, please, I invite you to visit our website at www.restorationministry.com. In fact, why not join us on Facebook? Every day we try to put up something helpful, some little thoughts, some little information that can be helpful to people. So it would be nice if you join us there. The address is www.facebook.com.restorationministriesja. Thank you. God bless you. Looking forward to seeing more of you again soon.